That's great. Pastor, I think, Lord willing, they should be back tomorrow, so you definitely want to be praying for that and in your place next Sunday as well. And we're uh, excited about the things that are going to be happening here. Uh, October really, uh, 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 Brother Larry mentioned it, October has always been my favorite month of the year. It really has. I just love October. I love the weather in October, uh, but I just think it is something about a harvest time. And uh, by the way, do you ever think about this? Why in the world did God create pumpkins? I mean, there's absolutely no use for pumpkins whatsoever. But I believe that God created pumpkins for children to want them and for good independent Baptist churches to use it for pumpkin patches. I mean, you think about it, man. A pumpkin is like the coolest thing in the world to have. He's like, I got my pumpkin, you know. And, uh, but there's no use for a pumpkin except for to give them out to children on open house. So praise the Lord for pumpkins and praise God for that. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 4. It will not be our text. We are going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 5 tonight. But... Um, a couple days ago, I saw this verse, and it, it definitely connected with what I wanted to preach tonight. And um, in Luke chapter 4, in verse 27, so I'm going to read a verse, and then I have a question for you this evening. I do want to also just say one more time, and I'm going to have a time of prayer for pastor and the group in just a moment, but I do count it a great privilege and honor to ever have the opportunity to speak at Lancaster Baptist Church, and I appreciate that tonight. We may have some guests tonight. You definitely will want to come back and hear the pastor of Lancaster Baptist next week, and I guarantee you he will be ready to go, and that book of Esther is awaiting him. Isn't that a great book, too? And I love the title, God's Got This. I think that is just a really good title for the book of Esther, and I put that in my Bible. I love that title, God's Got This, and he does, and he's working behind the scenes, and it's going to be a great uh, continued series in the book of Esther. Luke chapter 4, and I want you to look real quickly at verse number 27. Luke chapter 4 and verse 27, the Bible says this. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saying, Naaman, saving Naaman, the Syrian. So at the time of Elisha, there were many lepers. But there's only one leper during Elisha's time that is healed. And he's not even an Israelite. He's a Syrian. His name is Naaman. Take your Bibles now and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. Maybe the most familiar passage uh, or miracle that Elisha did is the story of Naaman. And it is a great story. But I have a question. Why is Naaman, who is a Syrian, the only leper that was healed? Who was it that caused Naaman to be healed? Now, I know you got your thought on that right now. It may be, uh, you may have the answer. But let's go through a list of people. Who was it that caused Naaman to be healed? Well, you might say. In verse number one, look at 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. But he was a leper. So maybe your answer would be, well, I think the key to Naaman getting healed is Naaman. And, and there would be absolute truth to that. He never uh, dips into the Jordan River seven times. It ain't going to happen. So I suppose in one sense you could say name it. But who, but look at, there was other lepers. Why is Naaman healed? And not all the other lepers. The other lepers could have jumped in the river. Why is Naaman healed? Oh, he, well, he was a great man. And he was. He was captain. He was a general. He was a victorious 
Man, he had all kinds of victories, especially in the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, he, was, uh, he was a great man. He was, uh, oh, he was a great man with his master. And you know, a lot of times military guys and political guys don't get along real well. But his king really liked this guy. Name it says a lot probably about his loyalty, his effectiveness. He was honorable. He was a mighty man. Hey, he was a thinker. Now, that was, now, now this isn't the most complimentary thing, but look at verse 11 in this chapter. But Naaman was wroth. You know, this is where, you know, uh, Elisha sent out a messenger and said, hey, go dip in the Jordan, or Jordan seven times. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, are y'all in verse 11? Behold, I, everyone together, what's the next word? Thought. Thought. Yeah, yeah. That's a dangerous thing to do. Let, let, let me tell you something. When you start thinking, that's where you get in trouble in your spiritual life a lot of times. I thought differently. You know, there is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When people start thinking out how they're going to get saved, when people start thinking out how they're going to get healed, that's when they get in trouble. You just follow the scriptures and what God's man says and what God's word says. But I love that little thing there. He says, I thought. And that is Naaman's number one problem. It wasn't the way that he thought. And there is a way which seemeth right in the man, but then there are the ways of death. Now, Naaman's not, is the only leopard that gets saved, not because of Naaman, okay? Number two, I know the answer to this, Brother Shetler. It's the government leaders of that time. Yeah, well, I think we know the answer to that already, but let's just confirm that, all right? Let's look down to verse 5. Talk about incompetent. Talk about disconnected. Talk about absolutely no spiritual sense at all. We have two kings. And the king of Syria said, okay, now, um, go to, go and I'll send a letter unto the king of Israel. This is a political matter that we need to take care of. Government can take care of this. And he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver. Hey, by the way, if government can't do it, money can do it. 10 talents of silver and 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. Think about the mentality of political leaders. They are so full of themselves that they think government is going to be the answer for every problem that there is. Can I tell you, that is so far from the truth. We do not need government to do anything but to protect us. That's the only purpose. Government is never going to provide the needs that man has. And so one government thinks another government is going to heal Naaman. That's exactly, so here's a bunch of money. Go to the king of uh, Israel, give him a bunch of money, and have him heal. I mean, what in the world? Verse 6, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying... Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he read his clothes and said, Am I God? No, government, you are not God, and that's a great thing to learn. To kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so, uh, and it was so that Elisha, the man of God, had heard. Okay, so we know it's not Naaman that's going to make this difference. We know it's not government leaders. Now, I know who you're thinking. It's, it's Elisha. It's Elisha is the, is the key. Well, let's look at this for just a moment. So, verse number 8, and it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. See, see so, Brother Shelley, it's Elisha. Hold on, hold on. Remember now, there's other lepers, and, and Elisha doesn't heal any of them. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door at the house of Elisha. I just love this. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, this captain, this general, this victorious man, this mighty man, this honorable man with his master, 
And he sent a messenger unto him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Man, I thought the guy would at least come out and see me. He sent some little peon messenger to tell me to go jump in the Jordan seven times. What's with that? I'm going to tell you what's with that. It's not about Elisha. And Elisha's trying to teach him that. Hey, this isn't about me. This is about my God. And if I come out and do this, you're going to give me all the credit. And by the way, they still try to do that because after he's healed, uh, look, look real quickly at, uh, at verse 15 and 16. And he returned. Now he's healed. Now he came out of the Jordan. He's healed. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. See, that's why Elisha didn't do all this. That's why Elisha didn't go on out to the river with them. He, Elisha did not want him worshiping him. He wanted him to worship God. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. You know, up until that point, I always thought Elisha was a good independent Baptist, but I guarantee he wasn't because he, the Baptist would have taken it, I just guarantee it. But anyways, before when I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Why did Elisha not take anything for doing the miracle? He didn't do the miracle. It's not Elisha. And if you look back, at Luke, you don't have to, Luke chapter 4, verse 27. So then why, not one leper, and there was a lot of them at the time of Elisha, not one leper is healed, and the only leper that is healed is a Syrian named Naaman. It's not Naaman. It's not government leaders. It's not Elisha. Oh, and don't do this with spirit. Oh, I know this one. It's the Jordan River, right? No, it's not the Jordan River. And that's not, believe me, I've been in the Jordan River. It is not, the Jordan River won't heal anyone, but it'll make you sick, okay? So it isn't the Jordan River. I'll tell you who it is. I'll tell you why this one leper from Syria is healed. It's because of a little maid. And I want you to see this little maid. I've entitled this tonight, The Little Maid with the Big Faith. The Little Maid with the Big Faith. And because of this little girl's faith to see this man healed and saved, I believe it is her. By the way, this is also such a cool thing. And I know Brother Furso will really attest to this because this is so true. You know what? The greatest soul, do you realize the only person who is not named in this story? You got Naaman, you got the king of Syria, you got the king of Israel, all of them are named. You got Naaman, you got Naaman's servant, Gehazi. You got everyone named, except for the one that God used their, her faith to see him saved, and that's the little maid. She is the only one whose name not mentioned at all. And I want to tell you, soul winning is not about you being recognized. Because number one, it isn't you that saves anybody. And that is so important to understand. The best soul winners are the, and by the way, nobody gets saved where there isn't people who have watered, who planted, and then some pick the fruit. And the reason why the key person in this story of Naaman getting saved isn't named at all, because that's what soul winning is. It's a team effort. Somebody plants, somebody waters, and somebody picks the fruit. But it's a team effort. And But so this girl's not even mentioned. But I'm telling you, it's her faith that made the difference. So let's look real quickly at her faith. I want you to see four things that will help you as you come up to open house and as you come to the SOS breakfast. Uh, I want you to be that little maid with the big faith. And I, I, I wrote down four observations, four things that I got from this that I think will be a really help. Number one, 
Every trip is a missions trip. Every trip is a missions trip. Like, what do you mean by that, Brother Schumer? I mean by that every trip is a missions trip. Okay, let's all say that together. Every yeah, I don't think you guys believe that yet. Everyone together, every, every trip is a mission strip. So if you go to Lowe's, going to Lowe's is going to be a what? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to Olive Garden this week? If you're going to Olive Garden, what does that mean? It's going to be a what? Yeah, yeah. Every trip is a mission strip. This is amazing. Look at chapter one, or chapter five, verse one. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king. Okay, then we go to verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Okay, so let me tell you something. This girl is taken captive out of Israel. But everyone together... How did she look at this trip? She looked at this trip as a what? Yeah, and she didn't have to raise deputation for it either. <laughs> she didn't have to raise any support. It's going to be totally funded by the Syrian government and totally funded by Naaman. She gets to go to the mission field and she didn't have to go on deputation. She didn't have to take any missions classes. And she knew that every trip is a missions trip. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You ought to be at the breakfast on Saturday. I think everyone's, oh, Saturday at the SOS, that's a missions trip day. I'll tell you what, I'm going there to do missions, and that's good. You should. But I will tell you, every trip you take this week, wherever you go, Chick-fil-A is a missions trip. Ah, that's my mission field there, Brother Scheller. Amen. I think we'll go visit Chick-fil-A a lot. I don't care where you go. Wherever you go, think of every time you take a trip, as a mission strip. This girl's on a mission strip. Now, let me tell you about divine appointments. I, I, I've thought about this a long time. I think there's three character traits we've got to develop on mission strips, all right? Number one, you got to be sensitive to these divine appointments. You've got to be sensitive. Number two, you've got to be smart. You've got to be smart. How can I use this to be a mission strip? And number three, you got to be surrendered. You have to be sensitive to be prompted, hey, you know what? There is an opportunity there. There is my mission. There is my, the one I'm, I'm there to reach. Then you gotta be smart. Now, how am I gonna do this? How am I, and boy, you start asking God, God will open doors in your mind. You'll think of it, and then you gotta be surrendered. Because I think this is really the key. There are three areas that if you want these divine appointments, you have to develop. Number one, when you surrender your trip as a missions trip, it's probably going to change your schedule. It's going to affect your time. Number two, it's probably going to take some effort. And number three, it's going to take some money. Usually when you do, it may not be much, it may be just getting some, somebody a little bit of food or a drink or, or something like that, or it could be really expensive in paying for gas or something like I don't know, I don't know what it's gonna be. It may, be, it, it may cost money in that it's gonna be a little larger tip, but you could tell you had a chance to pray with that, that waitress and you go, you know what, we're gonna give her a little extra tip because we really, we're leaving that open house track and we really, so it's gonna take, take some time. Your schedule will probably have to change with a divine appointment. You're gonna have to give some kind of effort to it and there's a good chance, not all the time, but there's a good chance it may cost you something even financially as well. I think I've given this story before, but it just so fits so perfect with sensitive, smart, and surrendered. So there are no hills in the city of Pensacola. It's totally flat, just totally flat. Except for at Davis Highway and uh, Airport Boulevard. And there's like a hill right there. And uh, years ago, Luke and I came up to the traffic light. It's one of the busiest traffic lights in the city of Pensacola. And Luke was with me, and he was a young teen. 
And we're sitting in the car. I had my suit coat on. I had my tie. And I don't know. I have no idea. I don't remember anywhere where we were going. But, we, but I remember I had my coat and tie on. And Luke was sitting next to me. And we saw, so we, we come up and we're the next ones. We're at the light for a long time because we're the first one now at, at, at the light. And a pickup truck is coming the other way. And it's on the only hill in the city of Pensacola. And, and it, it's, it's kind of uh, just kind of resting there. And the light changes. Now, this pickup truck is full of plywood sheets, four by eight plywood sheets. And, it, and I, there, there has to be 25, 30 of them just piled up. I mean, they're just really high. But this guy's got his, his tailgate open, and he's not worried about a thing because there's no hills that he's going to have to go up except for where he's parked. He takes off with the load that he's got. He takes off and I take off. And as soon as I take off, I see what's happening. As he takes off like a deck of cards, every one of those sheets come out of that pickup truck and are laying all there. People are screaming, they're blowing their horns and everyone stopping. And, and there is a pile of, of, uh, of four by eight plywood. I think it was half inch. He said, how do you know it was half inch? I'm going to tell you how I know it was half inch. <laughs> as soon as it happened, we went through and I said, Luke, we got to help that guy. We pulled off to the side and we got out there. And people are honking and swearing at me. I'm, going, I'm trying it. Why don't you come out and help, okay? So we're picking up all this plywood and we're putting all this plywood. Luke and I are putting, and this guy's putting on. I don't, I, I didn't stop and say, hi, my name is Pastor Shetler. Man, we're just helping him. I took my tie off. I took my jacket off. Luke's out there helping. We're all putting it. We put it all back together and it took a while. I mean, we're not just talking like three minutes, one light switch. No, 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 no. And nobody's doing anything. Thing, okay, and people are honking and they're all mad and everything. So we, so we help them out. Now his car is way down here, and and I'm way over here, uh, where I pulled off because I'm going the other way. So I'm on the other side and I'm all the way through the the intersection. So the guy comes over, he gives me a big hug. He says, "Man, what do I owe you?" He reaches in his pocket and he brings out his wallet. And I said, "No, no, 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 no. I don't want it." She said, "No, no, I got to give you something." He pulls in and he's got some bills in his hand. And I said, "No, no, no, no. You got to take it." I said, "Okay, I'll be fine." No, I didn't. <laughs> and I said, "No, no, no. I'm not gonna take anything for that. But I got something for you." He said, "You got something for me?" I said, "I got something for you." And I go and I had this DVD that we did, it was called Somewhere Forever. It's a 17 minute gospel presentation, clear gospel presentation that we did years ago. It's called Somewhere Forever. And I, I said, hey, listen, I want you to watch this. This will show you how to get to heaven. I'll never forget what the guy does. The guy takes it and he holds it to his bosom like this. He says, I promise you, I'll watch it. Now I gotta tell you, over my life, I have probably handed out maybe three to four to five thousand of these things. No one's ever received it that way. I mean, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever. But I got to, this guy like took it, he held it so much like this. Because you know why? You do something for somebody and it opens that door and you gotta be sensitive, you gotta be smart, and you gotta be surrendered to divine appointments. Now listen to this, need is the best soil for the seed of the gospel to sprout. Need is the best soil for the seed of the gospel to sprout. You want to see divine appointments this week? Look for need. Naaman had a need. Naaman is a leper. And as great a man as he is, he's going to die of this leprosy. And it doesn't matter what he's achieved and all the victories. This guy's got a need. Man, I'll tell you something. You go through the richest neighborhoods of this city. There's needs there behind those doors, let me tell you. There's needs behind those fences. And you go to the richest, nicest home in Palmdale or Lancaster. I'm telling you right now, there's needs. But you've got to find those needs. And when you see a need... When you try to fulfill that need and you're sensitive and you're smart and you're surrendered, you're going to be able to plant a gospel seed in that need. Boy, I got to tell you what, she jumps on this. Look at this, verse number three. And she said unto her mistress, would to God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he 
would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in, and two, there was a need. And she planted a seed. I'm telling you, the God of Israel can heal him. And there's a prophet over there that can do it. So you've got to look at these divine appointments. Okay, everyone together. Every trip is a... Oh, that was terrible. Every trip is a... Every trip you take, it's a mission trip. Now you gotta be sensitive, you gotta be smart, and you gotta be surrendered. And surrendered, it's gonna change your time, it's gonna make some effort, and it may cost you something. But I'm telling you something, need is the soil that the seed of the gospel sprouts in. So if you work with people, you see people that have a need, man, you are all on top of that. Every trip is a mission trip. Number two, every obstacle can become an opportunity. Every obstacle can become an opportunity. Now, I just want to tell you something. I cannot wait to get to heaven to meet this girl. I mean, she is a jewel and gem of all jewels and gems. Look at the obstacles that this girl's got. Number one, her gender. She's a girl. She's a feminine gender in this kind of culture, in this kind of society. So I want to say something to all the ladies. We are so messed up in femininity and masculinity today. And we get the idea that the only way that women can be successful is that they got to be like men. Can I just tell you something, ladies? That is a lie from the pit of hell. The greatest influence you will ever be will be when you're the lady that God created. You do not have to be a man to be successful and to be influential. We got a little girl who's extremely influential. I'm gonna tell you why. She's got two things that are all feminine. Number one, she's got good character. That this little girl is working in Naaman's house and it's a little girl, this girl's under 12 years of age. I'll just tell you that right now. She's probably nine, 10, or at the most 11 years old and she is working at the handmaid. You know this girl's got a good work ethic. She's got character. But I'll tell you what else she's got. And you give me a woman that puts both of these together and you will have greater influence than any man in this room. She also had compassion. She cared. Here is a girl, a feminine girl. Here is a young little lady who has got character and she's got compassion. And she's going to influence one of the most powerful people that the world knew at that time, Naaman. And I just want to tell you, ladies, you don't have to be like a man to influence your culture and your society. Matter of fact, you need to be like a woman. And you need to have what that little girl had. She had character and she had compassion. She didn't let the obstacle of her gender hold her back from influencing someone for Christ. Number two, her age. She's little. She's just a little girl. And I just want to tell you, I don't care what age you are. If you're an old person like me, use it. You, you know, it really is true. I believe that my age actually helps me now with teenagers. I think there's something, they, they, they want to see an old fat white grandpa guy, you know, and they'll listen. They're, I think I use my age for the cause of Christ. And you know what? If you're young, use that for the cause of Christ. Whatever, a, do not look at your, well, I could never witness because look at my age. No, no, no. She did not allow the obstacle of age to bother her at all. And don't you allow that obstacle as well. Her gender, every obstacle can be an opportunity. She didn't let the gender bother. Her age didn't let the, number three, her position. Well, she's like a little maid. I mean, she didn't do nothing. She's like a little maid. She didn't have an important position. She used that position for the cause of Christ. I don't know where you work. I don't know where you go. I don't know what you are. But whatever you are, wherever you go, it doesn't matter what your position is. Don't look at your position. Well, I could never witness to the boss. I could never witness to the supervisor. I could never witness to the commander. Look at my position. No, don't look at it that way. Use the position that you have. Your humble position may be wide open, but if you do have a leadership position, you ought to use that for the cause of Christ. God gave you that position to use that influence. Man, she did not. Every obstacle can become an opportunity. Her gender, her age, her position, 
her nationality. She's a Jew. Now, I want to tell you this right now. As soon as we as Christians get over this, why are we so stigmatized by the pigmentation of somebody's skin? We need to get through this stuff, man. We need to realize it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is or your nationality is or any of this stuff. That little girl is a Jew. She's an Israelite living in Syria, but she didn't look at that as an obstacle. She looked at that as an opportunity. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what color skin you got. Use that for God's glory then. Use that to, 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 I don't care what nationality you are. If you say, well, I don't understand English that well. I, I, I'm from Alabama and I don't understand English. I don't. <laughs> then use your, then use coming from Alabama for the Lord. I don't care what your nationality is. Use it for the cause of Christ. This is a girl who's an Israelite in Syria. Yeah, yeah, her obstacle was an opportunity, but I'm telling you. This is the one. This is amazing. She didn't look at, she didn't let the obstacle of her hurts. Everybody stop for just a moment. This little girl is away from her mom and dad. This little girl has been uprooted from her house. This little girl is a captive, is a prisoner in another country because of one man. Naaman. And the very guy that has caused her more hurt than anyone else is the very person she wants to reach for God. Come on. Some of you go like, you know what? If that person dies and goes to hell, who cares? Look at their attitude or whatever. Look at what they've done to me. She reaches out to the very person that hurt her the most. She is in captivity because of Naaman. She's away from her parents because of Naaman. And it is Naaman that she wants to see healed. Now, I don't know about you, but the average one in this room probably would say, no, well, good. When, they, when you would hear the word that Naaman's got leprosy, well, that's what he deserves. For him taking me out of my land and him taking me and pulling me away from my parents, good. I am so glad Naaman's got leprosy. This girl took the biggest obstacle of her life and used it to witness for Jesus Christ. Guys, come on. Man, that is unbelievable. Every obstacle can actually become an opportunity to witness. Some of the worst things you have ever gone through in your life, if you would finally get through it, you might be able to use it for the cause of Christ. Every trip is a missions trip. Every obstacle can become an opportunity. Number three, everyone can care so they can share. Everyone can care so they can share. She saw the need and she is concerned. She says, and the Syrians had gone out and a little, a little maid and she waited on Naaman's wife and she said unto her mistress, would to God, ma'am, that my Lord Naaman, my Lord Naaman were with the prophet Elisha that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Man, everyone can care so that you can share. It was August 29th, 2005. The year before, we had gone through Hurricane Ivan in Pensacola, and it was tough. We spent, no, no, without any exaggeration, two to three months helping people almost every day. I think when I went to bed at night, I had a chainsaw in my hand. I had never cut down more trees. I had never raked more pine straw. I had never bagged more tra trash, can trash bags in my entire life than we did the fall of 2004. On August 29, 2005, Pensacola was not hit with a hurricane. The Louisiana, and especially Gulfport and Biloxi, a lot was said about New Orleans and it was hit terribly. 
But Biloxi and Gulfport, our neighbors, were in really sad shape. It was about a week or so, it was, it was about a week afterwards, we were watching the news. And we were with my family. And they showed the lines. There's like, you know, like four gas stations open on Highway 90, you know, for like 40 miles. So you can imagine the line. And the line went on, it pro I don't want to exaggerate, but probably two to three mile long gas lines. And we're watching this. I'm going, man, these people are just waiting. For, and, they, and there's all rationed out. They just get a couple gallons. And most of us just trying to get gas for their generators. And they're all lined up. And Ben is watching the news with me. And he sees this long line on Highway 90 of all these cars. And he says, Dad, do you still have that connection with Jack Seiler, the, the Gideon guy? And I said, yeah. Yeah, he said, will he still give you, will he still give you uh, those, uh, those green New Testament in Psalms and Proverbs? And I said, yeah, I think I could. I'm not a Gideon, but, uh, but um, he, I kind of had a good connection with him, and he was like the head guy over the northwest Florida area. And I said, yeah. He said, Dad, what if we go tomorrow? And the next day was Saturday. He said, why don't we go tomorrow and take cases of Bibles and we're all, they're all lined up. Let's give them Bibles. And I said, yeah. And I'll get like a Capri Sun or something like that. Well, Capri Suns were too expensive, so I got Kool-Aid jammers. <laughs> and Ben and I loaded up a van with coolers of Kool-Aid jammers. And I got six cases of Gideon Little New Testament, Little Green New Testaments. And we went over. And sure enough, the Saturday, the line just went on. For, we couldn't even see the end of the line. And we parked on the other side of the road, and we started walking, and I, and I had the cooler, and I pulled the cooler, and I had to go back for, we had three coolers with us, I, I went back for each one, and, and we had the cooler, and, and, and Ben would have a case of Bibles, and he'd go back and, and get one, with, and we would go down the, the row, and we would knock on their, on their door, on their window of, of their car, and we'd hand them a Gideon Bible, and I'd hand them a Kool-Aid jammer, and Ben would hand them a Bible. And so we did this for about a half hour, and we, we ran out. It was time to go back. And so we're going back to get reloaded. And as we go back, Ben says, and Ben's crying. He's dead, look. Dead, look. And as far as you could see, there are people in the car, every car, there are people reading that New Testament sipping on a Kool-Aid jammer. As far as you could see, I Abby, mean, people are sipping on a Kool-Aid jammer and they're reading the scriptures. And Ben said, Dad, when could we have ever done this? Look at this. And you know what I learned? If you care, you'll be able to share. And I want to tell you something. When you have an opportunity to care, that's when you'll have an opportunity to share. Everyone can care so that they can share. See the need, take the lead. Last point, we're done. Every act of faith in God is rewarded. Every act of faith in God is rewarded. It is impossible to please God without faith. Now, let's go back for just a moment, because I'm telling look, look at what, no, no. Look at verse number two. So the Syrians had gone out by the companies and had brought away captive uh, out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, would God, God could do this. She has absolute faith. Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. For he would, without question, absolute certainty, this is what faith is, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And she was so confident about that. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, hey, thus and thus said this little maid, this little girl, that is of the land of Israel. She seems to be pretty confident about this. Why? In Luke chapter 4, Verse 27, the Bible says, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. I'll tell you why Naaman the Syrian is the only leper that is healed. It's because of that little girl's faith. God honored 
that girl's faith. You know, you get, ma'am, you get your husband to this prophet Elisha, he's got a connection with the true God. And I'm just telling you, you get him there, he will get healed. Her faith, out of the compassion of the person that hurt, hurt her more than anyone else, her faith was the reason why the only leper at the time of Elisha is healed is because of this little girl's faith. And if you think, well, you're kind of pulling that out of that, well, go back to your Luke chapter 4 and turn over to Luke chapter 5. And as you're turning to Luke chapter 5, listen to this. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means. So one of the means is an SOS breakfast for you guys. They sought means. There's going to be divine appointments that you're going to be able to do. That you got to be sensitive, smart, and surrendered. They sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way, I, Brother Purcell, I had to read this because this is like the greatest verse in the entire Bible on open house. <laughs> and when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with the couch into the midst before Jesus. Now that is an open house. <laughs> they literally opened the house. That was open house day. That was the open house Sunday there. And verse number 20, but this is what I wanted you to see. And when he, Jesus, saw. Now, every person in this auditorium, what is the next word? And when he saw everyone together, there. their faith, he said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. It's not the faith of the guy that was in the couch. It was in the faith of the men that brought him to Jesus. I am telling you, Naaman doesn't get healed because of his faith. God saw the faith of that little girl and God said, I'm gonna heal that leper. All the lepers, there's gonna be, Naaman's gonna be healed because there was a little girl that believed it was gonna happen. I wanna tell you this, you need to be out there getting someone for open house. You need to be at the breakfast and you need to do your part. But I want you to know, if you're sitting, standing out in the parking lot and your guest doesn't come in and your guest never shows and you texted him five times on Saturday, you brought over strawberries and everything else and you knew that you had them, you knew that you had them and they don't show. I know, believe me, I've been out in that parking lot many a times waiting for people to come in. Now listen to me. You still come into this service with an absolute faith that God is going to work and that God is gonna do something. I wanna tell you this, people get saved when people believe they're gonna get saved. And I share this with you. I know we're all burdened to always pray for the preacher. That is not the key. The key is you. Because if you get lost people here on October 23rd, I know that my pastor will give the gospel that day. And I know that the gospel will not return void. And I know that the gospel has power in it. But you've got to get lost people here to get saved. About two months ago, I did a thing called a men's, a barns meeting. It's way out in the middle of nowhere by Atmore, Alabama. This family that I used to pastor, they do this every third Thursday, I think, of the month. And I had the opportunity to preach. They've been doing it for like uh, 15, almost 20 years. And it started off of an evangelistic meal that we used to do at the church, a stakeout. And it was, it's called a barn meeting. And they have about 400 people come every, every time. Now, before I got up to, or at the, uh, not before, after my gospel presentation, when I was starting my invitation, I had everyone bow their heads, close their eyes. And I said, how many of you have done what we just talked about tonight? You've received Christ. And I'd say over 300 people raised their hand. And that was disappointing. Because I'm thinking like, this isn't about for saved men. This is supposed to be for lost men. And if all we're gonna do is fill our church with saved people, we're not gonna see people get saved. You gotta fill your church with lost people to get people saved. 
Well, we gave an invitation, and that night, there were 16 men who trusted Christ as their Savior. And we got to deal with every one of them, and it was a very special night. But as I was driving back home, I was about an hour away, and as I was driving back home, I said, you know, Lord, the gospel works. But we got to get people under the hearing of the gospel. And that's up to you to invite people. As much as you want to pray for Pastor Chapel's message on October 23rd, I think it's more important that you pray that you'll be the little maid that you need to be. And that you believe God's going to do something. That girl knew. That girl knew. He'll heal you. I know who you are. And I know you're a Syrian and you're a general and actually you're a bad person to take me out of Israel, but I love you and I'm concerned about you and I know you can be healed of leprosy because the God of Israel is the true God. And that's what we gotta have. Every, everyone together, every trip is a? Trip. Every obstacle can become an opportunity. Everyone can share, so can, can care so that they can share. And every act of faith in God is rewarded. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here tonight, you've never trusted Jesus Christ. You came to a good place. Because we'd like to tell you the greatest news of all, that Jesus Christ could be your Savior tonight. And you could be healed, not from leprosy, but you could be healed from sin. If you're here tonight, and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, I'd like to ask you, would you make an effort to be a little maid? Would you make an effort? You don't give me obstacles. All those R's are, are opportunities. Well, my schedule, I can't do this, I can't do this. You're going to have to make it a priority. And I'll tell you, to start by just saying, I'm going to be at the breakfast. And you get out there in the community and you start knocking on doors and you start seeing people's needs and you come up to someone and you may go through 15 houses. Nobody was interested and you were on every kind of doorbell and they knew you were there and they didn't come and all of that. But you got to talk to somebody and you could tell they had a need. And, and, and you got to make you got to make some effort. Are you going to be that little maid tonight? You know, I'm just going to ask this. I mean, we're going to hear the rest of our life a lot better soul winning messages than you heard tonight. There ain't no doubt about that. But I am going to ask this. Would you, for a two-week commitment, really surrender over to be the little maid? Lord, I want to do for two weeks. Every trip is going to be a missions trip. Every obstacle is going to try. I'm going to try to make every obstacle an opportunity. And I can care, so therefore I can share. I want to become sensitive. I want to be smart. I want to be surrendered. And I'm going to believe I am going to believe that you're going to give me people that I can reach. And Lord, I'm coming down on an altar tonight to say, God, I believe that I will have somebody here on Open House Sunday. God, I don't know if it'll be someone I've never met or someone I know really well. But dear God, I'm going to believe by faith and I'm going to step out as that little maid. I truly believe the Lord will give you opportunities. If you take every trip as a missions trip and you stop looking at your obstacles and start seeing them as opportunities, and if you start caring so that you can share, I'm going to tell you God's going to do something. And you're going to trust God. God, I'm stepping up. I'm asking for a two-week commitment. Will you be that little maid? I'll tell you this. You start doing this for two weeks, God will get a hold of your heart. And it'll be amazing. College students, would you be that? Well, we got a lot of obstacles. You know, it's midterms. You know, it's this. You know, it's this. We got, I'm just a college student. This isn't my home. I'm from Canada. And I'll, no, 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 no. Let the obstacles actually be opportunities. If you're a Canadian or you're from, from another country, wow, what an opportunity to talk to someone. Someone will listen to you just because you're from another country. Stop looking at your obstacles and see them as opportunities. So I'm going to ask the piano to play and we're going to stand to our feet. Go ahead and stand. God spoke to your heart. Would you be willing to make a commitment? God, I'll be there Saturday morning. God, I, I want to be that little maid. God spoke to your heart. Maybe at your seat, you want to just kneel and pray or come down to the altar. Or just say, dear God, I want to see something happen. 
God, I believe you're not done seeing people get saved in our valley. God spoke to your heart. You come.